Hello, everybody, and welcome to our um, May Happy Hour tour of the Alphond Inn collection at the Alphond Inn, part of Rollins College. My name is Alexa Labina. I'm the Associate Curator of Education at the Rollins Museum of Art, and joining us today are two of my absolute favorite people at RMA, two of our docents, uh, Richard and Joe, and uh, they're going to uh, take us on a slightly different tour than what you're used to viewing here virtually with us, um, where they're going to tell us a little bit about some of the favorite works that they've um, had a chance to use as part of their tours this past year from the Alphon Collection. Uh, and then I think give us a little bit of a sneak um, of what's to come. Uh, so I'm going to um, have them just kind of introduce themselves so we could all uh, uh, be better acquainted here since we're gonna spend some time together this evening and um, either uh, Rich or Joe, you can start uh, whichever you'd like to start. Just tell us a little bit about um, who you are personally and what brought you um, over to join us here at RMA. And I'll, I'll mute myself so I don't distract. <laughs> Richard, did you want to go first? Yeah, I can, I can go first. Uh, you know, it's, uh, it's, it's wonderful to be here. Um, you know, I, uh, I'm, my name is Rich. Uh, I'm a... Uh, communications and uh, PR professional here in Central Florida and just thrilled to have joined the docent program uh, with uh, RMA. And, um, you know, I was, uh, uh, I was drawn to uh, the work in the Alphon collection um, uh, because I've, I've always been sort of interested in modern uh, and uh, contemporary art. And, uh, you know, the, the American Modernisms exhibit, which is about to close, um, really sort of highlighted uh, a lot of the sort of Alphand and RMA, RMA's sort of permanent collection. Um, and it exposed me to sort of this broader uh, understanding of uh, American uh, modern art uh, beyond, you know, what my thinking was at the time, beyond just sort of abstract uh, expressionism, uh, beyond just painting. Um, so it was really this sort of education uh, for me. Um, what was, uh, you know, what was considered modern in sort of the early 20th century was not necessarily the fact that, you know, composition was not objective or, or non-referential, uh, but it was, you know, it was sort of exploring themes that were new or at least considered new at the time. Um, you know, like, uh, uh, like the artists of uh, the Ashkent School, um, you know, the painting and documenting sort of the, the gritty underbelly of city life in either New York or, or Philadelphia uh, at the turn of the century, right? So, you know, poor living conditions, uh, poor working conditions. These were, you know, depicting this in painting was something that was new um, and, and considered modern, right? Uh, versus sort of, you know, emulating sort of the old masters, the classical scenes, the sort of the still lives, et cetera. So, you know, I didn't know that much about uh, uh, African-American abstract artists um, before I really sort of, you know, begun to delve into um, the sort of uh, American modernism's uh, exhibit. And so it's, it's been a real sort of uh, education to me. Um, through this process, I got to learn uh, more about artists like Sam Gilliam and Al Loving, who I'll be talking about um, tonight. Um, so it was, uh, it, it was a great experience and just a uh, real education for me. Terrific. Yeah, I mean, you guys really spent a lot of time with the Modernism exhibition. Um, so for those of you who have been able to join us on Saturday afternoons uh, since, gosh, October of 2020 run, right? That's when we, we, uh, we resumed public tours um, at the museum, not yet at the Alphon. That'll happen uh, at the beginning of 2023, um, not the happy hour tours, the regular weekend tours. Um, but you guys, because Modernisms was up for two seasons, you really got to uh, almost develop two different versions of a tour pulled from that collection. So you guys really um, got to delve into that kind of content almost as much as we did as part of the staff. Um, what about you, Joe? Tell us a little bit uh, about what, what it's been like for you here at RMA. Um, first off, my name is Joe Esteban, and um, thank you for joining us. Um, I well, first off, I'm I'm an artist, or I'm 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 a wannabe artist, whatever you want to define it as. Um, I do a lot of painting. I take a lot of classes, um, and one of the re one of the main reasons why I chose RMA was because of the size of the museum. I was very impressed at 
what they have to had to offer as far as collections. Uh, I was very um, impressed by the whole thing. And just the, the intimacy of a smaller museum, I, I find it very, very appealing. But one of the things I found since I became a docent, oh, the other reason was I wanted to get back to the community. I, I believe in, in, in it enriches your, your life when you take away time from yourself and you're actually giving back to the community. But one thing that I did um, encounter from becoming a docent was learning about the artists themselves and then how they came about to become an artist, where they went to art school. And for someone who's always interested in taking an art class, I was hearing about art class, art schools that I, I had never even heard of. So I found that as a, a nice um, um, side um, a plus to um, becoming a docent. Plus the people, the, the people are great. Um, very, very welcoming staff and, and friendly. It's been a great experience. Glad to hear. Maybe someday we'll be leading tours of your work at oh, RMA, right? <laughs> you're not a wannabe artist. You're you're a, a burgeoning artist. That's that's okay, the way to look at it. Uh, and I, I for my, I mean, I can only speak for myself, but uh, I know we're so excited to have you all here. You've made this last year and kind of reintroducing these kinds of programs to uh, public audiences such a such a wonderful um, part of my day to day for sure. Um, and today they'll get to uh, to see a little bit of you guys in action. Those of us, those of uh, of our visitors that haven't been able to come in person. Um, so I'm going to quickly share my screen so we can get started with some of uh, the works. And just as a preface, um, uh, like I mentioned, both Joe and Rich um, have been working uh, with the collection and giving public tours at RMA, uh, but these include several works from the Alphon collection that are currently on view through the end of this week, um, May, I believe it's, it's Sunday, but I think that's officially the 9th of May, uh, will be the last day that um, American Modernisms and really all of our exhibitions at the museum are up. So if you haven't had a chance to come look at them, I hope uh, these guys talking about it today will uh, will inspire you to come out and take one last look. Um, and uh, with that, um, I think we're starting with you, Rich, right? So why don't you tell us a little bit of um, this piece that we have here, which is one of the ones that you've worked with over the past year, a little bit about it and, and what, um, what it's been like to work with uh, this, this artist in particular. Yeah, um, sure. Um, so uh, this is a piece um, by Al Loving um, that's that's currently on view at uh, American Modernisms uh, at RMA um, till I, I guess till this weekend. <laughs> so get out there. Um, so uh, Loving was uh, the the first African American artist uh, to have a solo uh, exhibition at the Whitney Museum of American Art, uh, and that was in 1969. Um, he showed uh, six uh, shaped canvases, uh, including this one, um, that really sort of explored uh, a hard edge, sort of linear geometric style of uh, abstraction. Um, this piece uh, was part of his uh, early uh, body of work, uh, it sort of built upon this strict but simple uh, geometric uh, shapes. They were often sort of uh, uh, hexagonal or, or cubic modules. Um, he was uh, he was inspired by uh, Hans Hoffman, uh, who taught uh, uh, Loving's mentor uh, Al Mullen. Uh, we've got we've actually got works um, uh, by Hans Hoffman uh, on display uh, at uh, American Modernisms right now. So get out there and uh, and see it. Um, so uh, Loving concentrated really on sort of tension between uh, uh, the flatness of uh, the picture plane. Uh, and sort of a spatial illusionism. Uh, he was uh, he was born in Detroit, uh, received his uh, his uh, BFA uh, from the University of Illinois and his MFA from the University of Michigan. Um, as I mentioned, his uh, he met his mentor uh, Albert Mullen uh, at the University of uh, Michigan. Uh, Mullen had studied with uh, German American artist and educator Hans Hoffman. Uh, Hoffman is really considered to be um, one of the most influential sort of artists and educator uh, on the first and second generation 
of American abstract uh, expressionists. Um, Lovin was also influenced by another German American, uh, Joseph Albers, who also has work uh, on view right now in, uh, in, in modernisms. Um, uh, and Albers, of course, came from the Bauhaus School. Um, uh, he, he taught at the Black Mountain College uh, in North Carolina and, and finally ended up uh, at Yale, incredibly influential. Um, so these influences you know, clearly showed in, in a lot of Lovin's uh, early work. Um, so he explored this relationship between these, this carefully sort of uh, delineated areas of color. Um, uh, this style was really um, what defined uh, American uh, abstract painting at the end of the 1960s. Um, and of course, you know, when we think of the US uh, in the 1960s, you know, we think of a time of social and sort of political turmoil. Uh, you know, students were protesting the Vietnam War. You know, the civil rights movement was happening, um, black, the black power uh, movement was happening. And so all these things were really sort of roiling uh, American society. Um, uh, but unlike, you know, many African American artists, um, you know, whose art really focused on sort of the racial politics of the era, you know, Loving uh, was different in that he, you know, he remained this sort of staunch uh, abstractionist. Um, uh, he was, uh, however, you know, something of an activist and, and, and took part uh, in a number of uh, civil rights actions uh, throughout the 1960s and 70s. Um, his, uh, his, his solo show at the Whitney uh, happened uh, one year after the assassination of Martin Luther King Jr. in 1968. Um, in, uh, in 1969, the year of his uh, uh, solo show, uh, there were protests at the Metropolitan Muse Museum of Art uh, in which, uh, you know, Loving participated. Uh, and it was it was around this uh, it was around this uh, exhibition uh, titled uh, Harlem on My Mind, uh, Cultural Capital of Black America from 1900 to 1968. So uh, the curator of this particular exhibit uh, was white and was being really sort of taken to task uh, by many in the black arts movement for for ignoring contemporary black painting and sculpture um, sort of in favor of, you know, documentary displays of, of black life in America. So as we move into the 1970s, you know, uh, you know, we see Loving become sort of disenchanted with his sort of early uh, hard edge geometric paintings. Uh, he began to do away with this notion of a, of a like a centralized uh, composition uh, in favor of uh, re sort of reconstructing like torn canvas and collage uh, paper works. Uh, so his, his, his later work, um, and, and I think about um, uh, the artist, uh, Howard Dina uh, Pindal, who uh, was his contemporary. Um, so his, his later work really sort of combined hundreds of pieces of cut uh, and torn canvas uh, or paper uh, into uh, works of really like, sort of like abundant uh, overlapping patterns and shapes, uh, you know, the rich dynamic array of colors that were sort of stretched haphazardly uh, across canvas um, and uh, really sort of spiraling outward, sort of surrounding the space and engulfing the viewer. So, you know, this, this was his later work that he, um, that he, he sort of transitioned to um, after this sort of hard edge geometric um, uh, uh, style. Um, and, uh, uh, I, I really enjoyed. I, I really enjoyed working and, and researching. Uh, uh, loving, he's an uh, in, incredibly talented artist. Uh, I was, uh, you know, I, I'm always impressed by artists who who really sort of remain true to uh, their their style and 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 their art. I mean, he 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 really received a lot of criticism from the Black Arts Movement, who really felt. You know, at the time, if you were black and making art in America, you really needed to be, you know, um, uh, you know, illustrating work that uplifted the black community, uh, that uh, showed what uh, living conditions were like for them, and really, you know, who really sort of ex expressed uh, an aesthetic that uh, was meant to socially uplift the black community. And uh, while you know, while uh, Loving did his part and was involved in the civil rights movement, his art um, was non-objective, uh, non-referential. It was uh, hard-edged geometric, uh, um, uh, abstract uh, paintings. And, uh, 
I like that he remained um, uh, sort of dedicated to that because that was his truth. So that's that's my take on Al Loving. <laughs> It's it's such it's really such a fascinating piece. I know um, I think all of our docents were really taken with this one, um, and I've always um, because of that conversation of the fact that this kind of geometric abstraction was, you know, this was the the epitome of what high art was at that point in America in, in the mid twentieth uh, century. I've always wondered to what it to what extent that played a role in you know him being the first African-American artist to receive a solo exhibition at the Whitney um, just because it did fit that white profile of what art was in, in going in opposition to what so many other Black artists, many of which were to an extent um, more established than he uh, were moving with. Absolutely. And, uh, and I think, uh, I think the following year, or at least in the early seventies, I know, um, uh, Sam Gilliam, who was, uh, also, he was more sort of a, uh, gestural sort of abstract, um, uh, painter. Um, I, I think he was, he, I think he was the first, um, African-American to, to represent the U S, um, at the Venice Biennale. And so there were all these sort of, um, first happening uh, during that period for black abstract artists and you know uh, within the art world and then yet you know within the black arts movement there 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 was you know there was this tension this you know uh, uh, conversation this debate happening about you know proving your blackness um, through art and and I, I just I just find that that tension you know just, just fascinating absolutely and so um and did either of you work with um, the Emory Douglas in the exhibition that's up now? Because um, that, if, if for those of you who have had a chance to be in the museum, this piece, it's such a great conversation um, against, it's facing uh, a, a, um, a few, well, we've rotated it, but we've had two different pieces from the same series by another artist who is not part of the Alphon collection. He's part of RMA's permanent collection, um, Emory Douglas. And he was the um, Minister of Culture for the Black Panther Party. Um, and the piece, the series we have is also from 1969. So it's, that makes it even um, a richer dialogue really. Uh, yeah. But it's so much about uh, not so much peaceful protests, but getting ahead almost um, in, a, in a militant way. And it speaks to this idea of, you know, it's a lot of referencing to the power of the gun and how you have to, you know, take your, your equality by force sometimes. So it's really interesting to see, you know, polar opposites of what, what, you know, the power of what art can do and what it can mean within communities and, and politically even. Yeah, um, yeah no, I, I, absolutely. I, you know, I love the, the Douglas pieces that are, are, are in the Alphand and the ones, and the one that was on uh, uh, exhibit or on view. Um, uh, in, in American modernisms, and uh, I love the fact that you know Douglas sort of, you know, in in, in a lot of his pieces, really sort of you know references uh, the sort of the uh, propaganda, sort of uh, pamphleteering imagery of of places like uh, Palestine at the time and uh, Cuba, and uh, and and really sort of you know, there, there's this sort of uh, revolutionary sort of uh, resonance to a lot of uh, the work that he does, uh, or, or he did at that time for the Black Panther uh, newspaper. Um, but yeah, it, it does stand in stark contrast to, um, you know, artists at the time who are making art at the time, Black artists at the time, like, like Loving and Gilliam, um, uh, because they, you know, it, it, their work didn't specifically reference um, the, the Black condition. Exactly. There was, there was no, uh no grounding in that experience correct correct uh thank you richard that's you took us through a fantastic uh you know moment in the life of this this fantastic artist that we have um and i'm going to move on ahead to one of joe's pieces and oops what's oh, thinking about it hold on there we go um, and Joe, tell us a little bit about um, this piece that you selected from um, from this past year that you've worked with and from the Alphon collection. So this is from the American Modernisms um, exhibition 
And this piece here is from Leo Amino titled Triumphant War Warriors. Um, he created in 1951 and it's mahogany. It's just under four feet tall. Um, and, and to start briefly on the American modernism exhibition, um, what was happening was a lot of the artists in Europe, and not in this case, he's from Asia, um, were settling in New York City. Um, in the case of Europe, they were fleeing um, Nazism and World War II, and they were basically reinventing what uh, modern art was. And they were trying different things. They were getting into abstraction, creating groups centered around abstraction. They were trying different materials. Um, in this case, they were going into wood um, and eventually into uh, prints. But a bit about Leo Mino, he was uh, born in Japanese Taiwan and he grew up in, in Tokyo. And in uh, 1929, he immigrated to the US to, to attend college where he studied at San Mateo Junior College in California. Um, and then he made his way to New York City, city to study at NYU. Um, he didn't graduate from NYU, but um, while he was there, he found work um, for a Japanese wood importer. And he would take home ebony samples, ebony samples uh, to try his hand at carving. And although he didn't have any uh, formal training, his, uh, his interest in, in sculpture uh, continued to grow. Um, the more he was is trying his hand at this. Um, and in 1937, he studied at the American Artist, Artist School in New York City. And I was told by my very first um, <laughs> visitor at the museum that this artist is pronounced Chaim Gross, it's a, a, Jew, a Jewish name. Um, and Gross was a, a leading proponent of direct carving and direct carving um, in wood or stone um, is from a single block. And it, what, what you get as a result is it emphasizes the properties of the material that you're working with. Um, and in the case of the wood, um, you can see the distinctive patterns of, of the veining, the grain, and the color. And it results in uh, simplified sculptural forms um, and smooth geometric outlines. One of, the one of the questions that I ask the visitors is I say, what comes to mind when you see this wood carving? Um, so some of the answers I've gotten were it's, it's very delicate. I, I think that's, that's pretty evident. Um, one person said they saw a ballerina, um, Keeping in mind this, the title of this is Triumphant Warriors. So the more I look at it, I do see, um, I do see a warrior. I do see a, a club or a, a, an instrument of war at the top. But the figure on the left, it almost looks like he could be dancing, throwing his leg up in the air. But it's that's the beauty of um, of artwork. There's there's not no right or wrong answer, and and it can be open to the the viewer's uh, interpretation. But with Amino, um, he was exhibited at the 1939 World's Fair, um, and he got his first solo exhibition in 1940. Um, this, in, this piece in, from 1951 is uh, an example of his mature work, where he was blending his skill at carving with his interest in uh, surrealism. And he sought to capture interrelated forms of nature and the human unconscious. But what is particularly striking about this piece is his use of uh, negative space, the area around the wood. Um, it provides the, the sculpture with the light, uh, airy quality, which, which is actually against 
at odds with the title, which implies something strong, solid, and, and muscular. Um, and what is important about this piece in 1951 is it was atypical um, of the time. Um, other sculptures, other sculptors um, were working on a large scale. They were trying to copy Picasso, uh, Cubism, and they were using multiple pieces of um, concrete or steel and they had hard lines. And there's the piece um, in the modernism exhibit right in the middle of the room. It's, it's twice as big as this piece from Amino and it's, it's steel and it's very hard edged. And then you look at Amino's piece and he's doing something that was basically completely new. Um, and I was told this piece is about 95% um, carved um, from a pe single piece of wood, which would be um, um, incredible. And I was also told that he carved this piece um, in his uh, Greenwich Village apartment. So maybe that might be um, the reason why he was going small. I, 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 I don't, I couldn't, uh, I couldn't guess. Um, but with the advent of World War II, uh, Amino, he began to experiment with uh, plastic resins. And I, I have a, a on the next slide, the, uh, an example of what he did with, with resins. And in this piece, he's, you can clearly see he's still interested in surrealism. Um, this piece, I, I see a figure and I actually see two faces. I see a head, eye, eye and nose at the top, but then where you would think are the shoulders, I see two eyes, I see a nose, and maybe where the belly button is, I see the mouth. So that's that's what I see. I don't, I don't know what you guys see. <laughs> um, that could easily have come out of a Dali painting, couldn't it? <laughs> yeah, yeah. He's um, like one of the artists from during the Surrealism movement was uh, Juan uh, Miro. Miro. Mm -hmm. um, and I can see a, a strong influence on that, what, what we're looking at here. Um, but these resins, these plastic resins, they were de developed as a, as a result of the, the wartime uh, scarcities during World War II. Um, but Amino, he became one of the first American sculptors to specialize in this. Um, and that's what, what made him so um, important um, as an artist in the, uh, in the 20th century. Um, and he eventually became associated with a group, the Abstract Expressionist sculpt Sculptors in New York City. And he went on to teach at Black Mountain College in North Carolina, 1946, 1950, and later at Cooper Union in Manhattan from 1952 all the way to 1977. And during this time, he was, he was continuing to to experiment. He's no longer alive. He died, I believe, in 1989. So, but I was one side note is um, when we when we first started as docents, they asked or Laney, Laney, Lexi asked us to um, pick a number of pieces, and it's uh, it's interesting. I, I guess people are are attracted to something they can relate to. So being uh, Asian American, I was interested in to see what this, uh, this Asian American artist, uh, his story and what, what he was producing. So I thought that was um, kind of cool. Absolutely. And it's such a striking piece when you see it in person. It is. Um, I don't know that this does it justice. Uh, like, like Joe mentioned, it's only four, well, for me, that's that's giant. That's huge. <laughs> Four feet tall is basically my height. But um, it's what when paired uh, next to this 
a massive sculpture by uh, David Smith, what you were talking about, Joe, in the middle of, of the, um, of the uh, gallery. It almost, uh, it minimizes it so much, but it really stands its own. It, they're almost like confronting each other and they're so different. <laughs> One being, um, although they're, I think it's really interesting. If you look at their titles, they're actually really similar, right? You have Triumphant Warriors by Leo Amino, David Smith, you have March Sentinel. So they're both these, you know, these militant figures uh, kind well, of that, coming to a head. <laughs> now that you say that, it's almost like looking at David and Goliath. Yes. I never even thought of that that way. Absolutely, um, but it's but it it, it is it has a, a quiet, delicate beauty, like you said, and it definitely employs these beautiful, almost organic lines and this biomorphic um, design. Whereas the David Smith, you have this these uh, it's almost like a, it feels like a composite, right? It's all welded together, and it right, looks yeah. very mm -hmm. much, you know, mm -hmm. it takes those cubist. Uh, um, cubist uh, influences um, but they're both abstract expressionist sculpture which is so it's almost mind-blowing when you look at them together they don't speak the same language but they're oh. part of the same family <laughs> mm -hmm. absolutely wonderful um, so uh, I've got I've got some sneak peeks uh, that, that you guys are ready to release on our uh, hopefully soon to be in-person um, audiences who will be joining you. Um, so uh, Joe and, and Richard put together um, a little a little taste of what we can expect to see in their tours over the summer. So these pieces are also from the Outbound collection, but they will be on view at RMA beginning. Um, we opened to the public the weekend of May 20th. So uh, our tours at RMA will resume in June. Saturday is 1 and 3 p.m. Um, so this is just a little bit of what you can expect. So uh, Rich, I think we have uh, your piece first. If you'll tell us a little bit about, you know, what this is that we're looking at and sure. what, what, uh, what drew you to this piece and this artist. Sure. Um, uh, so uh, this is a piece by Zanel uh, Maholi. Uh, it's uh, titled uh, uh, Kiniso. Uh, the sales Durbin from uh, 2019, and it is a uh, silver uh, gelatin print. Um, uh, Zanel Maholi is a uh, South African artist um, whose whose primary uh, medium is uh, photography. Um, uh, Maholi identifies as uh, gender non-conforming and prefers uh, they them pronouns. Um, the artist approaches their art uh, as a form of activism. Maholi uh, self-describes on Instagram as uh, a visual activist uh, documenting LGBTQ histories in South Africa and beyond. Um, so for probably more than a decade, uh, the artist has documented through uh, photographic portraiture, uh, the faces of the lesbian and gender non-conforming community of South Africa. Uh, Maholi, uh, she's got a, They've got a huge um, social media following. Uh, they have a blog at uh, inkiaso.org, uh, and they uh, co-founded uh, the South African-based uh, Forum uh, for the Empowerment of Women. Uh, Maholi is uh, best uh, known uh, work is the series uh, Faces and Phases, um, begun I think it was begun in, in 2006. Uh, three works of which are also. Uh, in the Alphon collection. Uh, this particular piece, uh, Kiniso, uh, the sales, Durban 2019, uh, will be on view um, in the upcoming summer exhibition, uh, Subject Artist. Um, and, and, and here, uh, the artist is the focus of the composition. Uh, as I mentioned, it's a silver gelatin print. Um, uh, the monochromatic uh, uh, self-portrait uh, depicts Maholi in profile. Uh, wearing numerous combs uh, in their hair. Uh, you'll recognize these as Afro picks. Uh, it's a reference to the self-affirming sort of uh, historical importance of the Afro pick uh, to the black community. Um, so uh, using a pick uh, meant that you were growing or wearing your hair naturally. Uh, you were sort of subscribing to uh, the black power, uh, black is beautiful sort of philosophy 
first popularized uh, during the 1960s. So the Africa, the Afro pick meant that you were living authentically, right? Um, so Kiniso, uh, the first word of the title uh, of the artwork means truth, right? Or truthfulness. Um, again, this reference to living authentically. Um, and uh, speaking about the contradictions sort of surrounding equal rights for gender non-conforming people in South Africa, uh, uh, Maholi was quoted as, as saying once, you know, you can't change laws without changing the images, right? So Maholi really uh, began to explore this sort of powerful impact of, uh, of the photographic images, uh, you know, while they were sort of taking courses in the Johannesburg uh, Market Photo Workshop. And this was a program uh, set up by South African photographer uh, David Goldblatt. Uh, he created these series of workshops to uh, uh, aid in the education and artistic development of, uh, of, of South Africans who had been sort of disadvantaged by apartheid. Um, uh, seems like in the past uh, 10 years, maybe 15 years, uh, Maholi has just absolutely exploded um, in, 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 in the art world and on the art scene, particularly um, for photography. Uh, and, and has really just uh, made such an incredible impact on uh, the photographic arts. And uh, uh, they're one of my favorite uh, photographers now. And uh, I'm, I'm, I'm thrilled that the Alphand has uh, uh, some of their work on hand. So uh, that's my take on Zanel. Excited about it. I know. And there's, there's so, I mean, we have at least, at least three four, five, six that I can think of uh, in the collection. We're very, very lucky and privileged to have so many of their works um, to because they explore so many different uh, conversations within this this one area. Um, I love how how striking the contrasts are in this image, even down to the earring and how that that pick is becomes almost a pattern um, and so embedded. Um, so far, what has been your favorite thing, if you don't mind my asking, about about them or about this image as you're continuing your research and uh, putting your finishing touches on your your tour uh, manuscript? I, yeah, no, I, I I love the fact that um, uh, you know uh, for Zanel, it's it, it's 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 more of just it's more about you know not just making uh, art, you know. Um, they're really interested in, in, in trying to change laws uh, in South Africa and, 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 and she, she tr they truly are um, uh, activist uh, artists and uh, that's been a huge part of, uh, of what has def defined their work. Um, uh, the fact that they're interested in, in changing minds and hearts and, and really uh, working uh, through the art and uh, uh, through having these conversations and 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 sort of policy discussions, um, you know, starting a foundation um, and sort of really being on the front line of uh, of of this movement is is something that's really impressed me uh, about the work that she does and the activism she's uh, involved in. So uh, so you know, learning more about her art, her art making process uh, as well as uh, their art activism is something that's just uh, really fascinated me. Absolutely. Yeah, their, their arts really weaponized in, in a really productive uh, way yeah. that I think yeah. few artists are able to achieve, honestly. Um, very well, yeah, yeah, contemporary artists, especially, yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah what they do. Very excited to see this uh, in a couple of weeks. Um, and then Joe, you have, uh, you have this work for us and tell us a little bit about uh, what you've discovered about Alex Cat so far, and what you're excited to uh, to continue unpacking. So this is um, from the uh, exhibition uh, subject artists, and um, when Lexi was giving us the overview of all the pieces, um, we had to pick a number of of pieces to talk about, and. <laughs> She mentioned that this piece was huge. So, I mean, and then she couldn't emphasize some, enough that it was huge. <laughs> so I wasn't gonna go home, so I was gonna go big. And 
I believe this piece is probably around five feet tall. Um, and it's titled uh, Amanda and Kyle from 2016 and Oil and Linen. I'll give you a, a background on Alex Katz. He was born in Brooklyn and he grew up in Queens. His parents um, were Russian Jewish immigrants. Um, but Katz, he is known for his iconic large scale paintings. And I, I think that says, you can't make more of a statement the larger you go, in, in my opinion. Um, he is known for figures and landscapes, um, but he combines uh, realistic and abstract um, elements. And as he was starting out trying to develop his style um, as a student, um, at uh, the Cooper Union Art School in Manhattan. And this was in the late 1940s. And he was awarded a scholarship for studied at Skowegan School for painting and sculpture in Maine um, in 1940 and on into 1950. When he was at Cooper Union, he was taught to paint from drawings. And then when he got to Skowegan, he was encouraged to paint from life. And this will prove uh, pivotal in his development as a painter. A painter. Um, and I, I found an article yesterday, um, he admitted to destroying a thousand paintings during his first 10 years um, as a painter in order to find his style. Um, me as a painter, I'm, I'm still trying to find my style and I hope I don't have to go through a thousand paintings like he did. Um, and as the early 1960s came around, his work was influenced by advertisements and films. And it was at this time he, he went big. Um, but he later turned to family and friends for inspiration. A lot of his paintings are the people um, in his life um, around him. And Alex, um, Amanda and Kyle painting. Um, she, um, Amanda is actually his studio assistant and Kyle is her partner. Um, so his, his images, they often uh, have a sense of intimacy and distance at the same time. Um, a quote from the New, York, New Yorker magazine um, said, his paintings make us see the world the way he sees it, clear and up close with all but the most essential details uh, paired away. Um, so here he's cropped the, comp the, um, the composition, he's focusing on the interaction of the, of the figures facing each other and is defined by flatness of color and form and, and the minimal use of line. Um, and they often say less is more. And I think when you bring that to a large scale, it, it does, it, it, to me, it's enough. You don't need to uh, really em embellish it um, any further than that. Um, and Katz said that his portraits go into a social thing because he's painting the society in which he lives, um, family members, friends, and, and people around him. So if you haven't figured out his age um, yet, if we can go back to the other photo, um, this is a, a painting of, of his wife, Ada, his second wife. And this was painted in 2018 when he was 91 and he is currently now 94, he's still alive. Um, Ada, he met in 1957 when he was having a, a show in New York City. And he has painted uh, his wife more than, more than 200 times. So I think that is, I think that's pretty cool. Um, I do have a, a, a soft spot for seniors. And 
It's, it's just great. Um, in his words, uh, she's the classic American, <laughs> sorry, American beauty. And she's also a European beauty. So, but he said that his, uh, his time at uh, Skohegan in plein air painting that gave him uh, a reason to devote um, his life to paint. So. I love Alex Pratt's paintings. Yeah. I think the very first, when I did my very first internship in a museum, the first piece I researched was an Alex Katz painting. And it was the first, the first time I'd been exposed to it. But I remember thinking um, that it felt like a memory. And now, you know, years later, that I'm quite familiar with his work, I still get that impression every time that I look at one of his works because of that sense of intimacy that you talked about. Yeah. Um, there, I mean, there was a lot of photos of, of him to choose from. There was one where he was all dressed up in a, you know, a coat and tie. And, and I guess this one was in, in the Bilbao Museum, the Guggenheim Bilbao. Mm -hmm. But then I saw this photo and it's like, I didn't even know it was his wife. And I was like, wow, that's a really nice painting of an attractive woman. And it turns out to be his wife. So, yeah. I mean, that's the ultimate love letter, right? I mean, paint you 200 times, yeah. you must really like her. Yeah. That's incredible. Um, and actually, you're going to be, you're going to, if if scale is what, what drew you to this piece, uh, this piece is actually about nine feet tall. I would have to stand on my own shoulders oh, to wow. hit the top of it. So I think, I think you'll be pleasantly surprised when you finally get to see it in person in a couple of weeks when we pull it out from, from storage. I think I'll, you can come sketch from it, Joe. <laughs> the one of the first of a thousand sketches you're gonna you're gonna toss while you look for your style um but oh i'm so excited to to see now that i've that we've gotten to see them through your eyes i'm really excited to to not just see them in person but to hear you guys talk about them uh in your tours um so uh actually i just wanted to say i really like the um the theme of uh this particular exhibit sort of uh, uh artist as subject um yeah. subject artist um, you know, just just the self portraits, um, the you know how how these artists sort of uh, convey uh, sort of a sense of their 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 personal right, their intimate personal life, either um, uh, with representations of themselves or, or or persons you know that they've that they're intimate with, they're they're close to who are in their in their everyday lives. So it's really sort of the sneak peek into the inner world of, of, of these artists. And um, it's, uh, it, it's an exciting exhibit and I'm, I'm, I'm really happy to do more work on it and to uh, sort of develop my tours more. Yeah, I agree. Absolutely. I, I, I think our, our curator, Dr. Hassal Carbonell really hit it out of the park with this one. And, and it's true, we do, it's, it's experiencing art in a different way, right? Because it's, it's almost these mini biographies where we're entering, we're invited into all these worlds, not just of their personal life, but of their sphere, as you mentioned with uh, Alex Katz, Amanda, and Kyle. Mm -hmm. um, so I think it'll it'll be one of many treats we have for our visitors this summer. Um, so if, if if you all will um, share any questions or comments that you have in the chat, um, Richard, Joe, and I will are happy to field any questions you might have. Um, about either the upcoming exhibits or any of the works that we saw here at the Alphon um, and the Alphon tour today. As we mentioned, this will be our last virtual happy hour tour because um, starting in the summer, which normally we don't have these in the summer, but we decided we've all been apart for too long. So we're gonna we're going to have them in the summer, but we're gonna have them in person at the Alphon. So you'll be able to um, uh, not not FaceTime, but you know, actual time face to face with us and we'll all be able to share a drink together and walk through all the fantastic spaces at the Alphant Inn and uh, kind of uh, discover what's around the corner uh, for anyone who hasn't been there in the last few months. There are several new acquisitions. Yeah. Are the, um, the happy hour tours, you don't have to make um, a, re a reservation, you just show up? So for the happy hour tours, uh, we're probably going to change 
a couple of things of how they used to work in the past. But generally, um, if you're a guest at the Alphond, just contact the front desk, but mm -hmm. definitely check back on our website in the coming uh, days and week or two so that you can have all the details. Um, but uh, that part's still still being discussed just in case we okay. have to do some, some number caps, but um, we'll have that, all that information in the website. Um, because we're just returning, you know, we're, we're not going to turn you away if you, if you, if you can't register ahead of time, we're, we're always happy to have everybody. Um, so it'll likely still be, you know, I'd like to definitely um, check the website. I plan to at least come out to at least one because I haven't been on um, one and um, I'd like to see how that, how that all works. Yeah, absolutely. We're all, all um, it'll be a mixture of docents and staff leading us over the next few months uh, for the next year, really. So um, we're excited to get to do that in person again. Um, but if there's no questions from our visitors, then I want you to just join me in thanking uh, Joe and Richard for joining us here today and for uh, sharing a little bit of their experiences with our collections uh, and in their first year of docents as they uh, graduate into their sophomore year. Uh, now they're leading the pack and they're gonna be mentors for all of our incoming docents. Um, and I'm gonna shamelessly plug our docent program. Now that you see the talent that we're working with here and what a, what a, what a fun time we all have mutually between staff and our, our team here. Um, we're still taking applications for anyone who would like to uh, join us. We, um, anyone from any background is, you know, you don't have to be uh, an art historian or even have a background in the arts to, to, um, to learn to appreciate a collection and talk about it. Because it's all just people getting to know people and lovers of art sharing their passions, right? So um, we have, I think Lainey, uh, put in the link to our um, application to join our uh, docents and gallery guides at the museum, uh, but we're taking applications through the end of this week. Uh, so Sunday will be the last day we take them. So um, definitely consider it. Uh, and this could be you uh, someday soon. <laughs> um, so again, thank you guys for joining us and, uh, and for walking us through a little bit of your, uh, your uh, thought process. Thank you for having us. Thanks, right. guys. Have a good evening, everybody. Bye-bye.